changes. And um, I got to tell you, this summer um, has been one of those summers where it's just like God going, no, I don't want you to go back to that in the fall. And I don't want you to continue that pace because that pace isn't one that's healthy nor sustainable. And I need to address some things about that pace and the reason why you go at that pace. And so like a couple weeks ago, like I said, um, well, many months ago now, a friend of ours gave us a book. And this book was called Living Fearless. And it's a book by a guy named Jamie Winship. And one of the things I love about this book, and every time I give it to somebody, and I've given out a lot of copies of it so far, but Every time I give out a copy of this, I said, hey, you're gonna, you'll really like this because it's not written by a pastor. And they're like, that's weird, coming from me. Like, but to me it is, because a lot of times, you know, like you get books, and a lot of the books that you read from Christian authors or are, are pastors that have kind of just kind of taken a message series, compiled them, and added a little bit more to them, and then put them out for mass publication or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the thing I love about this is this guy is a New York, he was a New York City police officer. He was a former CIA agent, and then he was also a, a former peace negotiator for the U.S. government. And so the thing that I love about this is he, he's, he's really what he's trying to do is help people hear God's voice and then do what he says. And so I would encourage you um, in your notes, if you scan that little QR code, it'll take you to today's notes that are online. On the bottom of that, I put in a bunch of resources. Um, and the resources are a couple of books that I recommended, but also um, some of the podcasts that we've been listening to over the summer. Now, what I do need to tell you before we go into this is some of what I'm going to share today is very personal to me and what God is doing in me. And one of the things I need you to understand is that it doesn't mean that everything has worked out perfectly and I'm doing this 100% to what God's asked me to do. Okay, so everybody give me some grace on that, because I think the thing that we've got to understand too is everything that God's doing is a process. The whole word, when Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it's, it's, meta, like, it's a metamorphosis, okay? It's like, just like the, the uh, caterpillar that goes in become, and has a season of time, and I, I should have like put this down, but, and then all of a sudden it comes out a butterfly many months later. I, I, don't, I don't know how long. Is there science teachers in here? How long does it take for that to happen? Huh? Oh, a couple weeks. Okay. I guess I need to get on this a little better. Okay. So, um, but it's a process. Like you were once this thing and now you're becoming something new. Okay. And so what I'm trying to do and what I want us to see today is this, is that wherever you're at, start there. Okay. So whatever you're at right now, wherever position you are at right now, don't like beat yourself up going, I used to be this over here and now I wish I was this. Let me just tell you something. The place you used to be was just a point in, on your journey where God has taken you. And I truly believe that you're still on that point. It's just you've become apathetic or you've kind of become just okay with being there. And God wants to do something new and take you somewhere else now. Okay. So he wants to continue to build on whatever he's, he's been building in you, okay? He wants you to get back to that place of obedience where you just go, okay, God, I want to continue to learn and grow. And here's the beautiful part about it. He's the one that's going to bring the transformation, not you by your willpower, okay? There's nothing I can do in my will. I mean, there is some things I can do in my willpower, but the major things that God needs to do in me, I just can't will it to happen. It's a genuine work of the Holy Spirit in my life doing these things. And that's the only way true transformation will happen, okay? And so what I said earlier, I want to just kind of reiterate because I want us to come at this from this place, okay? I truly believe, and this is one of the things God has just been stirring in my heart as I've been going through this season and kind of seeing what God's going to do, is there's been a, fr like a, um, a word that was given to me a long time ago was a holy discontent, okay? I, by nature, am, a, I would say, a critical person. Like, I see everything critically. Like, I can see everything that happened in this service already that's wrong. And I got to tell you something, it's irritating. But it, it, it happened, right? So what's the big deal? It's no big deal. It just happened. And so there's some of those things God's just going, you just got to, like, that doesn't matter. You know, and so 
I, I can either stay in those places and say, well, that's just the way it is. Like, I learned that from this, and I learned that by, like, being in charge of this at church way back in the day when I was in the, the whole, like, hey, production, performance, all this stuff. And so that highly critical thing came into play because then you had to make changes real quick for the next service and all this stuff. And so it was just a really unhealthy thing that was created inside of me. But there is also some things that, like, come out of that that are really good because then it helps you see like okay there's things that need to change so i can either be really angry and mean about it or i can go okay what do we need to do how do we need to come together so that all of us continue to move to the place that god wants us to get to and so when i have this this word that was given to me a long time ago of this holy discontent it really is that because what breaks my heart is that there's people that are sitting in this room that I've known for many years now. I mean, some of you were with us before we started New Life Church, and so at this point, we've got probably 14 years uh, under our belts together, right? And the thing that grieves my heart is that there's very little, if, if hardly any, transformation that's taken place from the moment that God did something big in your life. And here's, here's how I want you to, Here's how I want to get you there and help you understand what I'm talking about, okay? In the Gospels, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's at this point, and he's telling these stories, and he's addressing all these different laws that um, the Pharisees keep wanting to throw at him, like the law of Moses, like do not commit adultery, do not commit uh, murder, do not, um, all these different things. And so Jesus starts out this section with it by saying this. He says, you have heard it said, you have heard it said. You see, when Jesus said this, what he's doing is he's digging in to their oral tradition of, of passing on information, and really what happened in those days was they didn't, Jesus didn't get up and say, hey, can you open up to Matthew chapter 5? Okay, he didn't happen that way. And he didn't look at it and go, hey, can you go back to the Ten Commandments back there over and, you know, he didn't do any of that. He did, they just knew it because they had to memorize it. They, they didn't have, they had the scrolls that were in the temple and all that stuff, but they, they didn't have it on their personal being, just going, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Like, it was something that was handed down, and it was taught from generation to generation to generation. And anytime anything is communicated, like, through our voice to another person, if I said something to Selah over here, and by the time it made its way all the way back to Zach back there, I can guarantee that it's not the same thing that I said to Selah, right? And so he's now starting to unweave all these different things. You've heard it said. And yes, this is a very good thing, but then he counters it by saying, but I say to you. And so he takes this thing that was given to the people of Israel in the Ten Commandments, and he goes, you've made it only about this, but when you talk about adultery, you commit adultery when you even look at some another woman lustfully. Okay, so that takes it to a whole different level, right? And so what he's doing is he's digging into these oral like traditions, these things that have been handed down from generation to generation, and they've become a lot of times history within their, their story, right? And so one of the things that we need to see is we have to understand that you and I are shaped by the stories that we've heard, the stories that we tell, and the stories that we live. Um, one of my favorite books, and I forgot to put this in as a resource. If you want to write it in your notes, you can. And we're actually probably going to do something with this in the fall. But there's a series of uh, books that were a series of like uh, uh, studies that a guy by the name of James Bryan Smith did called The Good and Beautiful God. And in these series of uh, writings, there's four different books, um, he talks about this process of developing this kind of spiritual transformation process. He and another guy who's kind of the, found, the founding person of spiritual formation, if you want to say it that way, Dallas Willard, um, really begin to look at what does it look like for someone to spiritually transform? What's the process? And one of the things is we were, I was listening to a podcast that Alyssa just sent me this week, is he said, is he said, as they got into this, they always made it about the practices. Reading your Bible, praying, like all these different things. But what they were finding out is there wasn't much transformation that was happening as they were doing those things because what they discovered was many people had a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of who God really is and was. 
And so he said, when they read from a foundation of not truly understanding or believing who God is, then it, it tainted what they were reading and even how they prayed. And so he said, as he got into this, what he began to discover is, he goes, we've got to teach people who God is first. Like, this is crucial for them to understand and for them to grow and for their lives to transform. Because most of us, we, we have a good understanding and we would say, yeah, we believe that God's this, but there's some things I just truly don't believe or I haven't really experienced enough to truly believe it. And so, like, this is exactly what he's talking about. We end up coming at it with a different lens than what we should be looking at this scripture through. You see, in his book, Good and Beautiful God, James Brian Smith says this, says, we are shaped by our stories. In fact, our stories, once in place, determine much of our behavior without regard to their accuracy or helpfulness. Once these stories are stored in our minds, they stay there largely unchanged until we die. And here is the main point. These narratives or stories are running and often ruining our lives. This is why it is critical to get the right narrative or the right story. And so we're all starting from this place of, you've heard it said. I've heard, in this culture that I live, these are the things that I'm supposed to believe. And we can talk about all the different narratives that we've learned from our culture, okay? In this culture in which I've, I've grown up, I've grown up in this town. It's, it's pretty much a blue-collar city for the most part, or was when I was growing up. A lot of different factories, a lot of different employment through factories, things like that. So there's certain things that I learned about culturally that came from this blue-collar kind of work ethic, right? And then there's other parts that came from it. I grew up on the east side of Adrian, and so the east side of Adrian would be considered the rougher side of Adrian. And when I was growing up, I didn't there was no, I didn't understand any of that. I didn't know any of that. But there were certain mindsets. There were certain things that came from growing up on that side of the thing. I also went to a Christian school in high school. And so like there were certain things that I learned because of cult, being in that culture that was different than what I even learned over here. And so in culture, we begin to learn different things. We begin to hear different things. In my family, there's another whole part of this thing of learning story and understanding narrative and all this stuff is understanding that each and every one of us in this room Okay, have a different story. Even within your own homes, you often have different stories. Especially if you're like Alex or Dan and you grew up with like 1,800 siblings. Like, there's many different stories, right? But for me, like, I understand like, okay, there's certain things that were said and the way we say them is that's just what climbers do. Right? You've, you've probably said it that way. Well, that's just what this person does. And I would challenge, is that biblical? Right? Well, I'll just use this one. Climbers are just hot-tempered. That's not biblical. Right? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and what? So I become angry. If the fruit of the Spirit is working in my life, self-control is one of the things that the Holy Spirit produces. Right? So when we look at those things, like, you've got to understand, like, those family narratives, those are the things that will keep you from truly becoming who God wants you to be. But let's put it this way, too. I've heard it said from the lips of Sunday school teachers, pastors, or so-called religious people, you know, because I grew up in church. So there's another whole religious narrative that I have in there. And depending on what denomination I grew up in, it's, it's different than maybe the denomination you grew up in. And so growing up in the Assemblies of God is going to be way different than growing up in Fundamental Baptist. Right? <laughs> I thought I'd get an amen on that one. Okay. Um, they're two different narratives. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Right? And so we have to come to this place of going, God, whatever story that I have held on to, whatever narrative that I've grabbed on to, God, I want to take all those things and I want to lay them down at your feet. I'm going to surrender all of them. And here's the beautiful part I know about God. The things that need to remain, God leaves there. The things that need to go, he removes, and then he begins to replace them with something true about who he is. And so that's the place in which I want us to, to start today. If you haven't seen change or transformation in your life, 
What I need you to see is I need you to look at your story and the story in which you're living. Because if you haven't figured it out yet, what you're going to figure out is people will do anything to make, you, make sure their voice is heard. Okay? And that happens in the church. That happens in our culture, in our society. It even happens more now if you have Facebook on right now. If I said something and you have your Facebook app and your phone, you will see it this week multiple times saying you need this thing, right? And if you have a, if you have a family narrative or a, a narrative in your thing, it's like, oh, I've got to have this, you know, because I don't have enough, then that's going to make me feel like I have enough, then I'm going to, I need to go buy that, right? And it's going to set this chain of, you know what I'm getting at here? But you go, even go a little bit further with AI. Like AI is literally predicting all the time what you and I are wanting and what you and I are needing. Why? Because of the things that we say, because of the things that we search, because of, you, you name it. There's all kinds of things. And if you haven't figured out That voice wants to be heard. And that voice will drown out the most important voice. And if you haven't figured it out yet, people will will do anything they can to make sure you don't hear his voice. And that should be capital H. His voice. You see, if we're not careful, the very things that we thought were beneficial to our lives might be the very thing that keep us from truly hearing and living out what it is that God has for us to live out. You see, I'm tired of living out these lies. I'm tired of carrying these false sense of beliefs, these false narratives in my life these false stories, these things that are are setting me up, ultimately they make me feel good, but they're also setting me up for, I I wouldn't say failure all the time, but they're not helping me live this full life that Jesus said that he came to give me. And so really today what I want to do is I want to take you through some different things. And as we go through these things, there's there's a series of questions. And in your app, if you have the app open or if you have your Bible and you have just a piece of paper, I would encourage you to write these down. Because let me just, let me say this to you, okay? This can be for a person that is eight years old all the way up to 100 years old. If you're older than that, then older than that, okay? I don't know anybody that's older than that. God never stops transforming your life and your story. He never does. And I know that there are still lies that even the oldest person believes in here that keeps them from truly living out what God has asked them to do right now, right in this season of life that they're in. And I believe it to be true. So here's what I want to do. I want to start by sharing a quote with you from a guy named Dan Allender. He's a um, Christian psychologist, but he's really big into helping people with their stories. And he wrote this book called To Be Told. And I want you just to think about this for a minute. He says, so take seriously... This story that God has given you to live. It's time to read your own life because your story is one that could what? Set us all ablaze. What happens if all of us truly begin to embrace the story that God has for my life and your life? What could happen? What could happen? So in order for us to understand that, I've got to I've got to go and tell you a little bit of my journey and what God has done. When Jesus countered all these different things, he said, you'd heard it said, but I say to you. And so this journey and where we're going to transition to now and where we're going is, what is God wanting to say? And so in order for me to hear what he needs to say, I really have to ask myself this question, what am I afraid to hear? Or what are you afraid to hear? Now, if you have to, take a picture of this so you can go through it in the next couple of hours, days, whatever it is. But what are you afraid to hear? If you slowed down long enough, if you truly listened, maybe one of your false narratives is that God doesn't speak. And I would I would say, just based off of my own experience, yes, he does. He speaks in many different ways. 
One of the primary ways is through the Word of God. Another way is through His Holy Spirit. Another way is through the community of believers, the church. And so there's three easy ones right there. But if we avoid His Word, and we avoid His Spirit, and we avoid His community, then yes, you aren't going to hear Him. It's just truth. But here's what I want to say to you today. What is it that you're afraid to hear? Are you afraid because he's going to shift something in your life that's going to have you have to do something drastic? Is he going to ask you to give something that you didn't want to give? Is he going to ask you to surrender something you didn't want to surrender? Is he, well, let's put it this way. He made it very clear, meaning Jesus, that he has come to give you life and life to the fullest. And anything that doesn't look like that has to go. So what are you afraid to hear? Because here's the thing. Fear always controls the narratives of our life or the story of our lives. Fear always does. The majority of people in this room, if God tells you to do something, the majority of our first response is fear. And yet, Paul t- or John tells us, he says, there's no fear in his love because perfect love casts out fear. So then, this is the thing we got to understand. If fear is our normal response to it, then do we truly believe that God is a God of what? Okay, let me say that again. If fear is our first response to anything, then do we truly believe that God is a God of love? Do we believe that? And this is a a question that I'm asking myself too. Because there's certain things that I know, yeah, oh yeah, God will love me when I do that and I do this and I do, like, but man, he can't, after that, he, he, his love might be conditional. Well, what don't we understand about Paul's words that nothing can separate us from the love of God? And I think Paul pretty much covers every spectrum of it. So then the initial response needs to be, if we want to do that, is we have to get to this place of repentance that says, God, I'm sorry that I haven't believed that you are a God of love and you can love me no matter what my story is, no matter past, present, or future. God, I'm sorry. Because that's, I mean, that's foundational to what God is wanting to do in you. You see, fear controls our narratives. And when fear controls our narratives, you avoid close relationships. You avoid intimate moments. You avoid God's word. And you've made up reasons not to do certain things. The number one thing that I see when people don't want to do something that God is asking them to do is they avoid any kind of intimate moment where they might actually feel or have some kind of emotion. Because maybe, even in their narrative of their story, they were taught that emotions are bad. Who created your emotions? Okay, let's, let's just make this. Let's counter this one for a minute. Who created your emotions? God. There are warning lights on the dashboard of your life that says, hey, something needs to change. Like, I don't just continue to drive around my car when it says you've got low oil pressure. But like, we continue to do that in life. And yet we we continue just to go, well, I'm just an anxious person. Why? Why? You don't have to be. Like, he's giving you perfect peace, it says. And he said, oh, by the way, his peace is going to guard your heart and your minds. But what do you have to do? You have to surrender that anxious moment. Or maybe you need to look at that anxious moment and go, what is it about that moment that's causing me anxiety? Is it a person? And does that person match something in my story that caused some kind of abuse or trauma? Is it that? I don't know. I don't know where it comes from, but this is what I'm saying. Do you get where I'm going with all this? Like you've got to start digging. And a lot of times we don't want to dig. And so what we do instead of digging, we just avoid. We just move to another section of the yard and hope that that doesn't come up over there. And that's what we've done in the church. That's what we've done for many years. Is we just kind of just sat. And it breaks my heart. Because I know people in this room that any time... Um, like 
an emotional thing comes up, they're, they're, they're far from this. Anytime there's any kind of like close, like small group can t- potentially be something that's personal or intimate, they just, they move. They're like, boop, oh, I can't be there. I got to do this all of a sudden. It happens all the time. Or you, you start a group and you get a group of people together and sooner or later they be, start seeing kind of where this is going and they're like, yep, not going there. And you're like, oh, hey, where have you been? Oh, yeah, I just can't make it. Like, I've been doing this. We all know it, right? And here's what I'm saying. Let's stop letting fear control the story that God wants to write in our lives. You see, perfect picture is the story of Moses for us. Moses is at this point where he is now shepherding his uh, father-in-law's sheep in the wilderness. And I'm going to just summarize this story really quick because I really want to get to a place where you can kind of begin to see what God wants to do in you. And Moses is out in this wilderness and he, he sees this bush that's set on fire. And he sees that it's not being consumed by the fire. And so he moves towards it. And from that bush becomes the voice that God speaks out. And from that moment, God is giving Moses this assignment. He says, I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt, and I want to send you in to bring them out of Egypt. Okay, this is all really quick paraphrase. If you want to read more, go to Exodus 3, okay? But what we see in this moment is a reaction from Moses, okay? The first reaction was from the words of God, where he removes his sandals from his feet because he realized that the place where he was standing was holy, and so he knew that there was, there was something different about this moment. And in that moment, after that moment, he listened to a holy God that gave him his directives. And here's the thing. As you read through the book, if you decide to read through the book, Living Fearless, you're going to see uh, the story, uh, some of this story in there. But he says, God didn't address Moses as a shepherd of sheep, right? From that point forward, what you begin to see is God addressing Moses as the deliverer of a nation. He says, I'm sending you to bring these people out. God had a plan for Moses' life that was different than the plan that he had. And why was Moses tending the sheep in the wilderness? Anybody know? Huh? He was hiding, but he was what? Someone said over here. He was afraid. Because if you rewind back, he's afraid because he was over here and he, he thought that he was doing the right thing by killing this Egyptian because he was like harming one of his people. And then he buried him and then Aubrey started talking and so he fleed into the wilderness, right? So now God is addressing him and saying, hey, you're going to go to Egypt. You're going to talk to the brother that you grew up with and you're going to tell him to let my people go and you're going to lead these people out. And Moses is going, uh, 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 whoop, uh, uh, nope. Well, what am I going to do about that? Like, how am I going to do this? God, you know the story. The story wasn't good. I was an idiot back over here, did something that I shouldn't have done. They're surely going to kill me if I go here. And God goes, I'll go with you, right? And God, from that point, begins to shape and change the narrative in Moses' heart and his mind. To a place where as you forward into this story, you see that Moses goes and does exactly what God told him to do. But his identity wasn't in the fact that he was a killer, that he was a shepherd of the sheep, but God saw it as he was the deliverer of a nation. And so, if we listen to all the other voices, we are just a murderer. If we listen to all the other voices... We're, we're only good enough to be a shepherd of sheep. But if we listen to his voice, he has a plan that's bigger than anything you could ever imagine for your life. And my guess is there's glimpses of it throughout your whole story. It's just these other voices have been louder your whole life. It just is. So the question becomes, what narrative does Jesus need to untie in your life? What part of the story does he need to untie? Because there's a complexity to this. We talked about this. When we just talked about the anxiety thing and trying to figure out why that person triggers this and why this does this, like it, it's complex. It's like tangled up. It's a tangled up mess. And let me just tell you something. The Holy Spirit is a master 
at untangling things. He's really good. Have you ever done one of those games where you stand in the circle and you have to grab people's hands by, across from you and then when you're all, like, you're all entangled, now they're like, okay, now get untangled. And at first you see this, you're like, I don't know how we're ever, I mean, like, I don't know how it's going to happen. And then so-and-so has to climb over your leg and, you know, like, sooner or later as you work through it and you begin to figure out kind of how things work, you end up standing in a circle with everybody's hands together. You see, the Holy Spirit, He knows exactly what needs to be undone so that this can come and this can be the way it's supposed to be so that this thing can become alive, more alive in your life than you ever thought before. But you have to get to a place of believing that He can do it. That He can do it. And what I want you to see is this. He has a story that He's written for your life from the beginning of creation that only you can live out. Only you. And here's what I'm asking you to do. Would you have the courage enough to move towards a God who's completely loving in every way, who is good? And just, if you want to take and study one characteristic of God that will radically change your life, just, uh, just begin to study the goodness of God. And then once you get past that part, like go faithfulness, go holiness, go all these different things and really begin to allow that foundation to be firmed up, that foundation to be established in your life so that you can end up becoming who it is that Christ has created you to be. Last week I shared with you this picture that I keep getting of our church. And this picture was one of a house. And this house is beautiful. Everything's put together, all the the yard, the landscape, you know, it's like that neighbor that you hate because they're like perfect and yours isn't. Um, and their house just looks beautiful and everything looks really good on the outside. But like, it's like God took me in the, and like cut everything in half, right? And then when he cut everything in half, you begin to see like, oh, what's inside. You begin to see some of the closets that are, you know, like the Monica closet, if you're a friend's person, you know, like that's just got all the stuff stuffed in that no one can see, but everything looks really good. And then you cut down and you get down in the foundations and you begin to see that the foundation from the top surface looks really good. But what you begin to see is there's cracks that are happening. And the cracks that are beginning to form are because there's these pockets of dirt underneath the house that no longer have dirt underneath. They're like sinkholes. And God really began to firm up this picture this week in a way where I went back and I read the story where Jesus talks about the firm foundation and he says this, he says, so everyone who what? Who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise, a far-sighted, practical, sensible man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods um, and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against the house, yet they did not fall because it had been founded on what? The rock, okay? This is the foundation in which we are to establish our lives on, which is who God is. It's a foundation that cannot be um, taken out. It's, it's solid. It cannot be washed out, as we're going to see by winds and waves and rains. It's, it's solid. But he says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and then does not put them into practice or do them will be like a foolish. And I love this part. The Amplified Bibles are great. A stupid man. Don't say that word. I can hear Riker right now. You can't say that, CJ. You know, like, a stupid man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the torrents, and the winds blew, and slammed against the house, and it fell. A great and complete was its fall. You see, God is wanting to firm up that foundation. He's wanting to establish something new in my life and your life. And can I tell you, I, I believe it starts with this question. And I, I will say this. I think Bill, Bill is in here, isn't he? Bill came to me a few weeks ago now, and he just, he asked me a simple question. Simple question was this, what is your identity? And I gave him like, you know, a two-minute thing that I just made up. Sorry, Bill. But I was like, I don't know where he's going, but I'll have to at least sound like I know what I'm saying. Um, and he said, hey, can I pray with you? Because I believe that this week as you're gone, like God just really wants to show you who you are. And, you, and the fun part about this is, is like identities. I love talking about identity. I love talking about story. That's just part of who I am. You're going to see this in just a minute. 
But he said, can I just pray over you? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm never going to turn away prayer, you know. And so he began to pray. And, and so he prayed this prayer. God, just show him, God, who he is this week. Tear down the lies, build up the truth. And so I went into that week. And that week, my wife had this rule, which we did pretty good at. Like, we couldn't use our phones, but Dustin and Taylor were in Oregon. And so still trying to do all that stuff, too. And, and, but for the most part, I just spent time praying this prayer reading um, the book, reading um, Ephesians um, as well as I was doing this. And, and one of the things I had to do at first was I had to start with a couple of different questions, okay? And the first question that really sparked was, what lies have I believed? What lies have I believed? Well, if you've been around me long enough, you know that the, probably the three core lies, really, which sum up is just one word, which is not enough, um, has been the core lies of my whole life. Not smart enough, what I have is not enough, who I am is not enough. And, and it's this, it's, it's been damaging in so many different ways. Um, and whether it's in relationships, whether it's in ministry, different things like that. Because when you live with that feeling of that, you have to counter it with something else. And so when you live with this idea of you're not smart enough, everything you do is to make sure that you never look dumb or foolish again. Right? I mean, it's, it's as dumb for me to even say, it's like foolish for me to even say this, but there's times where I wouldn't even play a game against somebody because I knew if I wasn't going to win, I didn't want to play. I just didn't. Because I didn't, wanna, I didn't want that to even come into play. And so as you begin to look at this, you all know, at least I'm pretty sure you do, the lies that have controlled your life. So for me, those three things. So then the question then becomes, God, what do you need me to know about those lies? And I got to tell you, it was in that moment afterwards, Katie and I were walking. Man, why can't we like live in Holland? That's anybody else like, I mean, not the country, but this, this, you know, at least for the six months of the year, it's beautiful. Okay. Anybody else? Or at least the West coast of Michigan. It's way, yeah. Okay. Good. I'm glad there's few people that agree with me. Um, but Katie and I were walking that day, and I just began to share with her some of the things that God said. And God countered the lies I believed by one word. Well, two, actually. But one at the, at the initial, which was beloved. And I'm like, I, I think I shared this a few weeks ago, just really shortly. But then I'm like, hey, I, I, do, I don't like that word. <laughs> it feels like a girly word. You know, like it just like, God, can you give something else? But as they begin to read into that, there's so much more. There's so much more to understanding that word. Not smart enough, he countered with the word beloved. I don't have enough, beloved. Who I am is not enough, he just countered with beloved. And what I began to realize is he is enough. I am loved, I am accepted, and I'm appreciated by my Heavenly Father. So, Bill's giving me a hand. Okay, there you go. Now, that's just the tip of this. It's very, very important to understand now where God wants to go from this. And this is all, remember what I said, this is all a process. So even, even this morning, God is still revealing more stuff in these different areas. Because as you kind of lean into this and you allow God's Spirit to begin to show you different things, there's certain, certain situations he's going to take you into again, and then he's just going to whisper this, love, this word beloved. And then he countered it again by saying the word abide. So this word abide means to stay right there, don't move. Like stay connected. Jesus gave us a perfect picture of the vine and the branches. He said, anyone who reigns in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit, but apart from me he can do nothing, right? He says, come. It's an invitation that he gives all of us. He says, come, you know, find that rest. If you're tired, worn out, burn on religion. And then he says, the second part of this is now, stay here. Don't move too fast. Because for me, it's really easy just to move really fast through this. And over the, the summer, um, what we've begun to do is kind of rethink or rewrite. And we've been trying to think through this whole, what's your journey? Like, how do we help you from this place of, complacency, apathy, or just un, un, unknowing to this place of like 
truly living up this life that God wants you to live, this full life that he's promised. And over the summer, some of the things that the language that's begun to change is we believe that there's three things that you and I need to do to be, look more like Jesus, but that we would look like his disciples. And it's, you'll, you'll hear these terms, and we're going to talk more about this in weeks ahead, but um, one of the things that we said is we want to see everyone everywhere living aware of God's presence every day. Like that's core. Like his presence is everything. Like if you have a problem being in a room with other people, if you have a problem like getting too close and too intimate and stuff, like you're not going to like God's presence. Right? But we've got to allow him to do what he needs to do. And it's in his presence that everything changes. And it's not just in this room. It's in your homes. It's in your workplaces. It's like beginning to recognize that everywhere we go, that's where he is and that's where he wants to be. Second part of this is everyone everywhere living out fearlessly their identity in Christ every day. Remember that, fearlessly living this out. And the last part of it is just everyone everywhere living out their call to love well every day. Now, I just want to say this again. This isn't a complete story yet. And I don't believe it will be complete until I meet Jesus. But this is an ever-changing, like ever-evolving journey of transformation that God has me on, and hopefully he has you on. And here's what I want to show you. What I've learned is abiding is the most important position we learn to live out our identity fearless. Like abiding in what he says, abiding with him, being where he is, is the most important thing we can do. But here's the thing. One of the things I think we need to do well or better at doing is celebrating when we begin to untie some of these things. Dan Ellender in that same book said this way, he says, one of our greatest failures in our busy, driven culture is that we don't celebrate the temporary untying of a complex narrative. What, it, what is your style of celebration and ending? Do you only throw large parties after someone graduates, gets married, or dies? If so, all other endings in a story are lost in the wake of another day's busyness. He says, perhaps one of the reasons you and I don't party well is that we don't know what to do with the tragedies that linger in our lives. Can you imagine receiving an invitation to a party that says, join me in a celebration of I'm no longer believing I'm stupid? We don't allow endings to be noted, let alone celebrated. Therefore, we never allow uh, denouncement to invigorate the upward movement of a new story. Because God wants to write a new story. He doesn't see it as new, but he sees it like you see it as new. And maybe many times we need to be a little bit more together so that we can celebrate when God begins to untie the complexity as of you're not smart enough. Because Here's the thing I got to tell you. As I ask that question, God, what do you need me to hear? And then who do you say I am? He began to speak four different words. And these all came in a little bit different order, but they're, and I'll share with you how they came. But they've all been added in, and there's kind of an order to them now. But the first word he spoke is, God sees me as a restorer. And when when I look at this idea of restoring, Like, I look at the story in which I've lived. And I look at all the different experiences and things that I have. And I really believe that when God calls us to be a restorer, He's he's calling us into this thing where we see people and places. And we see hope and potential in all those. One example is this. Right? This is a physical example of it. But throughout our whole story, my wife and mine together... This has been one of the driving hearts for everything that we've done and all the people that we've come alongside and helped through their stories and their journeys. It's just we want to see restoration. I mean, you've got to understand, we've taken some arrows because of this. We've had people accusing us of uh, uh, or backing abuse. We're like, nope. We definitely don't do that. We've had people accusing us. Uh, I mean, you, you just name it. It's, it's crazy. But when hurt people are hurt, guess what they try to do? 
hurt people. And it's like, no, we're just going to stay consistent. And that's what God's asking you to do, just stay consistent. But here's the beautiful part about the restoring part and the picture that God continues to give me. is like there's all these pieces that he wants us to pick back up and begin to help assemble back together. He wants us to see the potential in the rubble that he sees. Because here's the, here's the promise. That God wants to give us the things that are hidden in darkness. The, the things, there, as Isaiah calls them, the hidden treasures that are there. But we have to have eyes to see that. The other thing that he began to speak, the second one was um, awakener. Like that's just my personality. I want people to see. Like there's part of me, that's why I love the marketing part of my life where I get to do that kind of stuff because it really is about awakening something, awakening people to other things. This is why I love speaking because when I speak, it's more about, hey, let's wake up. Let's wake up to see what God has for us, right? The second part is the discerner part of it. Like discernment is a huge part of what the gift I believe that God has given me. And he, I believe he's given it to us through his Holy Spirit. And here's one of my favorite verses that God gave me as we went through this. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. It says, and, my, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That that thing is going to continue to grow more and more as I understand that I'm beloved by him. Like, do you get that? And so that's the thing I want to continue to grow. And then the last one is simply this, resourcer. I don't even know if it's a real word, but I made it up. Resourcer, okay? But I, I love consuming things. Like, I love that. And part of that, I got to tell you where that came from. I, don't, I didn't like reading. When I was in high school, I finished one book, and it was the Fab Five, okay? Only book I ever finished. And I graduated from LCS. Okay, so, um, and so here's what I want to say. Like, God can use something that was used negatively and bring something positive out of it, okay? And what I mean by that is this. I didn't like reading. I didn't, but there were certain things they, like, I was forced to read. I don't like Shakespeare. The hithers and dows and whatever, I'm like, give me the movie so I can pass this class, okay? Like, that's the only reason I passed English for, okay? But the, there was something that changed, and part of it was, is because of this lie that I believed for so many years about not being smart enough, like I then dug into things because in order for me to counter when people challenged on something, I had to be smart enough. And so it's God's, God's giving me that now as a, a like gift to like love knowledge, to love learning things. The difference was before I used to use it to destroy people or to like keep them like contained. And here's the thing, like, there's so much. You have no, like, as a believer in 2024, you have no excuse not to know who God is. There is more information, there is more resources than ever to truly know who he is. But yet there's still one resource that's better than any other resource that could ever be created. And you know what that is? The Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said he's going to be the one that's going to lead you into all truth. And he's going to continue to point you to Jesus. And Jesus is going to continue to point you to God, the loving Father that he is. And here's what I want to say to you. If you're willing to take this journey, he's willing to speak and tell you things that you weren't willing to listen to before because you were afraid. But it's your choice. And so today, I, this is just simple, how we're going to end. Katie's going to come. She's just going to start playing some songs. And here's what I invite you to do, okay? One of the most precious places to me growing up was a place that we called the altar. And when I grew up at Bethany, it was a big old blue, like, looked like a pool, okay? Um, carpet was blue. They had all these risers and all this stuff. And I know one of the disadvantages we have of the hard floors is a lot of us won't get down on our knees because it's just hard, right? And so today, I don't... Can you say? I believe that the same God that met me at an altar in 10th grade is the same God that wants to meet you at an altar today. 
And that altar might look different. But that, that day changed my life. And why do I say 10th grade? Because I want, to, I want to remove every barrier for you to go, well, God doesn't speak to me. If he can speak to a 10th ten, grader, he can speak to you. If he can speak to a 5th grader in Sunday school, he can speak to you. Like, he, he's not holding back talking to you. You're plugging your ears and not listening. And there's some of you that I've just been praying there's some people I wish were in this room today because my heart breaks for them and how cynical and critical they are. And they wonder why they don't have relationships. It's because they've not allowed the love of God to completely transform that part of their story that keeps them in that place, that keeps them locked up. There's so many people that I wish were in this room that would understand that their stories no longer that they used to have Rob, can I give an amen that your story no longer perfects you? Um, okay, what seven time convicted felon. You're like, whoa, what? And he'll tell you the story. I can pull him right up here and he'll tell you. That doesn't mean he, can I just can I say this? Doesn't mean he's perfect. An angel said, Amen. Um <laughs> But he's becoming more and more like Christ. The thing is, you and I have to get past this point of just going, it's a 10 a.m. or 10.05, 10-ish, like, till 11.30, 11.45. Like, we have to get to a place of going, God, I just want to meet with you. And I don't care if it's noon. I don't care. If you have kids back there, I'll go watch them until you're done. I love playing with kids. That's awesome. Just play dodgeball or noodle hockey like I did earlier, okay? But what I'm saying to you is this. Something has to change. And the thing I know is he doesn't. So the only thing that can change is me. I don't know what it is. Bill's not got some magical prayer. He just, he just felt led that day to go, hey, I want to pray for you. And it started this whole different journey. And I'm so thankful for it. And guess who gave him the book? Right? That's how it works, really. I got the book from somebody way back in March. And it's been, I mean, it's not, it's not even about a book. Can we just not make it about a book even? It said, you have a God who knows exactly what you need even before you ask it. He's just waiting for you to ask him what you need or what he knows you need. That's the difference. It's a different way of praying. But here's what I want to do today. I'm not trying to move your emotions. I'm not trying to, I'm just asking you to try to open up your ears and ask yourself these questions. What lie have I believed that's been sabotaging my story? And God, what do you have to say about that? And if that's all you do today, we win. Because if the only word he speaks to you is beloved, your whole life's different. Because the next part is, is simple. At this point, it's like, okay, God, who... Who do you say I am? And I'm telling you, don't discredit this. There's probably even words right now that are going through your head that the enemy is trying to go, oh, you're just, you're making those things up. You're making those things up. No, he's not. That's the Holy Spirit prompting something in you for you to respond to. There's some of you that this weight that you're carrying is heavy and it's not meant to be. Like you can just let it go. Like you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You have new life in Christ. So let's begin to lean into it and see what he wants to say to you and I. Can we do that?